All right, folks. Let's see. Is this nice and loud for people? You can hear me pretty well, even if you're far away. Uh, and we do actually have closed captioning today. And Christy, we are getting started. So we have a closed captioner who's away from our site. And if a person ever wanted to check into that, they could join our Zoom webinar, which will have the subtitles across the screen. We're not having them run behind because it might be a lot of different stimuli for you folks in the room uh, otherwise, but uh, that's possible to do. And if you do, however, log into the Zoom webinar in order to access that while you're in the room, I just ask that you mute your computer so we don't get feedback. Okay, so that's an important aspect. We want to avoid the feedback. So let's get started. Um, I'm so glad to welcome all of you who are able to join us here in person today, as well as folks joining us online. Uh, and uh, this is the inaugural lecture of the 2022-23 Dalhousie Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. I'm Sheila Wildman, and I'm Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. Our director, Matthew Herder, is lurking over there. Uh, and our wonderful administrative coordinator, Ashley Johnson, is just on my right uh, over there. We are grateful to convene today's lecture and those that follow in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders past and present. We also acknowledge the histories, contribution, and legacies of African Nova Scotians who have been in this territory for over 400 years. Before turning to introduce Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed, permit me just a couple of framing remarks. First, I want to mark an enormous loss to our school, community, and world. Professor Meinhard Dwell, a longtime friend and law school colleague was taken from us in untimely fashion last weekend in a road accident while in accordance with his politics and his pleasure riding his bike. Meinhard was a leading environmental law scholar and climate justice leader, local, national, and international. He had an indelible impact on the work of environmental regulation again, local and international, and he was a generous and gentle teacher and friend. The tragic end to Meinhard's life and his life's work, and the fact that this lecture falls on a day of climate action, urges us to consider the deep relationship between health and the environment, and more specifically, the enormous inequitable global suffering, insecurity and death, that our resource extraction and consumption have unleashed in the form of climate change. We at the Institute will seek more ways over time to make the connections between health justice and environmental justice more explicit in the spirit of Meinhard's tremendous efforts to keep the bright light of hope for humanity burning in the face of great adversity. So let me shift uh, with some information about our seminar series. The Dalhousie Health Law Institute is a joint initiative of the faculties of law, medicine, health and dentistry. The Institute's long running seminar series offers an important public forum for interdisciplinary research on some of the most important and often contentious legal and policy questions of our time. This is the 26th year and 200th lecture in the series. You can learn more from Matt, Matt Herder, again, our director, uh, about the Institute's doings in and beyond the seminar series at a reception that will follow immediately uh, on today's lecture. And there will be cake. Oh, you've got to mute that. <laughs> Thank you. Cake uh, and more in room 312, which is the faculty lounge up on the third floor. So you're all invited, even those online who might wanna come in when they hear that there's cake, uh, you're all invited to come and join us uh, there. This year we've convened our eight seminar series lectures around a deceptively simple theme, 
health and social justice, making the connections. Today's lecture provides a foundation for those that follow as Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed reflects on the subject, social and structural determinants, where health really comes from. Uh, we're recording today's seminar for distribution on our website, but the camera will stay focused on the speaker. I want those in the room to be aware of that, though, that it is being uh, otherwise recorded. So now a little on our wonderful colleague and speaker for today. Whoops, starting her slides already. Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed. Um, Dr. Watson Creed is Associate Dean of Serving and Engaging Society for Dalhousie University's Faculty of Medicine and is past chair of the board of Engage Nova Scotia. She's a public health specialist physician with 17 years experience, having served as the former medical officer of health for Halifax uh, and deputy chief medical officer of health for Nova Scotia. She has served as a member of the One Nova Scotia Coalition Economic Strategy Table and the Federal Task Force on Women in the Economy. She is co-chair of the Advisory Council to the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health and a member of the CIHI Advisory Council on Population Health. Dr. Watson Creed has an MD from Dal uh, Dalhousie University and an honorary doctorate from Acadia. There's much more besides I could say. Uh, and as you will gauge for yourselves, she is a passionate advocate for high quality public health services in Canada. Without more ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Watson Creed. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wellman and to Dr. Herter and Ashley for getting me here today on this um, crazy September thing that we're having. Um, hello, Health Law Institute. So lovely to be here with you and um, with all of the people that you draw in, both in person and online. I see some colleagues here from uh, provincial government. Good to see you. And so uh, old friends and new. So I'm going to take about an hour. I want to make sure that we have time for questions before cake um, and um, give you a bit of an overview of uh, social determinants of health. And where I'm going to start that is um, actually with an overview of social determinants of health. Yes, but I'm then going to take you into the work of public health just for a while. For a couple of reasons, I'm not going to lie. I do love public health. It is, it is my place. And it is the work of public health. Uh, the primary orientation of public health is around determinants of health. And that's how I know what I know about social determinants of health. So I'll take you there. And then we'll, we'll talk a bit about uh, the techniques that public health uses to uncover social determinants of health when they are contributing to health inequities. And I'll use some examples. I have about six examples. Um, that I'll use just to illustrate that point, and I'm sure we'll have a ton of fun. So I don't have any of the usual, uh, you know, material or financial uh, conflicts to declare, but I will declare that I do truly love public health. That is my major <laughs> disclosure. Okay. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Wellman, for the, uh, for the land acknowledgement. So I won't repeat that. I'll just dive right in. So how many of you, at least here in the room, I can't see the folks online, but how many of you have seen this list of determinants of health somewhere? Yes, okay, quite a few, right? And so you'll see this list replicated in a number of places. This one comes from the Government of Canada. So this is on the Public Health Agency of Canada's website. CDC Atlanta has a similar list that they use. You can find similar lists for the uh, National Health Service in the UK, and it goes on and on around the world. And so these are the things that we recognize contribute to health. And when I first encountered this list as my as a trainee in public health, I have to admit, um, you know, I can read the list and I can understand what it says, but the actual impact of any of these individual items on the list was a little bit lost on me. And so my hope today is that you'll get a sense as to what those impacts actually really are and it, more, more specifically how to look for those impacts uh, when they're at play. Um, but I'm going to start with this, which is, you know, uh, this question about, but why is public health interested in social determinants of health? And I think what everybody knows about public health, um, and certainly has seen of public health in the past two years, is that, you know, most folks understand public health to be interested in communicable diseases. We're interested in a lot more than communicable diseases, by the way. But I will admit that COVID has not helped our image in that respect. 
Um, and to be fair, the practices of public health around communicable diseases, and in particular their links to the environment, go back thousands of years. This is true, right? So even the uh, ancient Chinese understood that there was something about the fluid of smallpox infected children, that if you applied that fluid to non-infected children, you could prevent those children from becoming infected, right? So that focus on communicable disease control um, has been there. But even as we've been focusing on communicable disease in public health, we have also started uh, over the past three or 400 years to turn our attention to other uh, things that may be at play in any disease state. And so this is a quote from the lower, uh, the health officer of Lower Canada. So this would be one of my predecessors in, in, the, in, uh, in public health. In 1816, at a time where Canada was absorbing a tremendous number of European migrants as part of colonization, quite frankly. Um, but the quote from the Lower, health, uh, the lower Canada health officer is this, they describe uh, these migrants as the wretched and miserable class of starved people that annually arrive. Wow. What a description. So aside from the ugliness and judgmental nature of the <clears throat> quote, what is this medical officer pointing to? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Poverty. So this is 1816. And even then, this medical officer with all the flaws that are attendant with this whole scenario that I'm describing for you, was able to identify poverty as a root source of illness. And, and you know, his goal was uh, to prevent those illnesses from infecting those who were already here. And so the early efforts of public health, yes, were sort of uh, focused around communicable disease control, engineering and environmental controls for that, but also um, around um, poverty. I want to be clear when I'm talking about the public health system, this is just a little bit of a sidebar that I do not mean the publicly funded healthcare system. I just want to be very clear about that. So I'm talking about the formal public health system that is specifically structured for this purpose. And this is the original uh, definition of public health from Winslow in 1920, the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting physical health and efficiency through organized community efforts. There've been several variations on that definition of public health. But that's the system I'm talking about. That's different than the publicly funded healthcare system that provides our hospitals, doctors, nurses, nurses, clinics, MRIs, et cetera. Um, and we'll talk about both uh, during this presentation, but just want to, be, want to be clear about that. And so that uh, prevention work that the public health system does, thank you, um, I'm sure. Um, the prevention work that that public health system uh, does includes looking at root causes of disease. Where, where does that uh, come from? And so this is how I describe that work when I'm trying to describe it, you know, to folks who really have never seen this before, like my accountant or my parents who get what my family doctor sister does. And they, you know, in the early days sort of looked at what I did and said, yeah, we kind of get it. My parents are both sociologists, but they were also like, it's weird to see that happening in medicine. What exactly is public health? And so this is how I describe it. And I had the uh, benefit of licensing both as a family physician and as a specialist physician in public health when I did my training and I maintained both of those uh, designations. And so as a family doctor, what I would say is everybody knows the experience of going to a family doctor, right? So you go when something is wrong with you and um, you might go for a preventive visit around or counseling around something, but generally you'll go if something's not uh, right. And if that family physician will see maybe 20 or 30 patients a day. And they're interested in anything that those patients bring in that is that problem of the day. And so they may go from a well baby visit to giving somebody travel immunizations, to doing a mental health counseling visit, to removing somebody's sutures, to checking on their chronic disease status. And at the end of the day, they'll have seen those 20 or 30 people and they will have a sense of what was wrong with them and what they could do to move sort of their, uh, their health forward. And if they didn't know that, they knew they could reach out to a specialist community that might be able to give some additional ideas. And together, the patient, the specialist, the family physician will figure out a path going forward that gets the patient back on the course to, to health and to wellness, hopefully, right? And so your average family practice might have 1,500 patients. They're not going to see necessarily all of those patients every year. But through the course of those days, they see 20 or 30 at a time uh, and as needed. As a public health physician, I am not interested in anything that makes people sick as individuals, full stop. 
I am interested in anything and everything that makes them sick in groups or has the potential to make them sick in groups. And I want you to think just for a moment about that potential to make people sick in groups, right? The potential for illness, for bad health outcomes comes from our environment. It comes from the foods we discern from that environment. It comes from our drinking water. It comes from our air quality. It comes from the quality of social connections that we have in those environments. Those, that's where the opportunity for prevention is. That's what links public health in its prevention mandate from that 1920 definition to social determinants of health, which are those conditions and communities that I just, that I just outlined, right? So if you had asked me, um, you know, as a family doctor, if I knew the limits of my practice, I would say, of course. And when I reach the limits, I'm going to reach out to that specialist commu uh, community and they're going to help me figure out where to go next. You ask me as a public health physician what the limits of public health practice are, my answer is I don't know. And even if I did know, I'm not really sure where I would reach out to as a specialist because you can't refer the whole population. But this is why public health systems are tied to government structures around the world is because when you reach that point in public health practice where you need that extra level of support, the only agencies that have the reach into the population to put in place those interventions that might actually work in that prevention realm are government agencies. And so you'll see attachment to municipal, provincial and federal governments around the world uh, for public health structures. So if you had asked me as a medical student, if I ever had to know anything about the life cycle of a mosquito, I would have said to you, well, what does that have to do with health exactly? Oh, no, wait, that's West Nile virus prevention, malaria prevention, Zika virus prevention. So if you can interfere with the acquisition in the life cycle of that mosquito getting that disease, you prevent that mosquito from becoming a vector to pass that disease onto humans and other populations, right? So entomology, yes, has something to offer the practice of public health. If you'd asked me if I had to know anything about the engineering of highways, again, I would have been like, so that's engineering. What does that have to do with medicine? Oh, that is trauma prevention. So if you can actually design the highways in such a way that you minimize the impact of that motor vehicle collision and the kinetic energy that's transferred from the environment to the human, you prevent that human from ending up in the emergency room. That is trauma prevention, right? Some of my most fun collaborations as a public health physician were with environmental engineers, uh, traffic engineers, architects, urban planners on questions like these. So again, if you'd asked me if I had to know anything about city building, I probably would have looked at you like you were crazy. But no, that is actually chronic disease prevention. What I frequently say to my colleagues who do, for example, chronic disease management work, like the endocrinologists and the cardiologists, those types of, of groups, is that we all know what to tell our patients to do um, to keep their, themselves healthy, right? And we'll talk more about this in a while. But if we haven't physically built it, in our communities, it doesn't matter what we tell them in our ivory towers, they can't do it because it physically does not exist. I got a phone call from a public health nurse, this was about 10 years ago, in Sheet Harbor, Nova Scotia. And I was at a meeting in Toronto, my phone rings, I pick it up and it's this nurse on the phone and I'm thinking there's a crisis. And she says, no, 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 I just needed to share the good news with you. I am at the opening ceremony for the sidewalks. And I was like, that's fantastic. Sheet Harbor got sidewalks, which meant that our messages around chronic disease prevention through active transportation could actually land somewhere because there were now active transportation routes in, in Sheet Harbor, right? So if it hasn't been built, it doesn't matter. So again, some of my favorite collaborations have been in that space. And if you would ask me as a medical student, if I had to know anything about um, grade 12 graduation rates, I would have said, and why? Because that's the education systems to do. Oh, no, wait, it turns out that graduation from grade 12 in the language of your choice with a high degree of literacy in that language and math skills is the major, most impactful determinant of health. So you start to see the broad reach of determinants of health and the interest of public health uh, in that work. And so when I talk about the prevention work that public health does to uncover those social determinants when they're at play, and, uh, and engage with them. We have a name for that. We call it primordial prevention. This is different than the type of prevention I mentioned before that you might do in your family doctor's office. And so I describe it this way. Um, so public health, um, well, the healthcare system is represented on the right-hand side of this slide. 
And what you'll hear us talk about in health is these levels of prevention. And so you'll hear us talk about primary prevention. That is, there are risk factors for disease out there. We should do something to prevent that risk factor from actually becoming disease in any individual. So that's where you might do that counseling with your family physician around smoking cessation or alcohol consumption or something like that, right? Secondary prevention is ee, too late, disease has started, but it's early. If we catch it early, maybe we can actually reverse the disease. So this is where our screening programs come in, right? Our cancer screening programs, for example. Tertiary prevention is too late again, disease is actually established. We can't do anything to reverse it, but we can at least prevent hopefully the worst outcomes of disease so it doesn't shorten your life. That's often the work of our specialist groups, those subspecialists and specialists that we might reach out to from family practice that I mentioned before, right? So I wanna just focus on those definitions for a minute. I said that primary prevention is there are risk factors for disease out there, you should prevent them from coming, at becoming disease in any individual. Of course, we would all agree that's a good thing to do. Public health practice, primordial prevention is about this. It's about actually preventing the, the risk factors from ever existing. Just wanna let that sit with you for a moment. Preventing the risk factors from ever existing. So if you think about where those risk factors come from in communities and how those communities are structured, that's a massive task, right? Prevent the risk factors for disease from ever uh, existing. So sometimes when I say this, I hear from people, okay, so come on, Dr. Watson, that's, that's a little bit like public health, you know, kind of chasing rainbows and unicorns. And then I hear from other people, oh no, wait a minute, you've kind of done that with tobacco, actually. We do have whole generations of young people who actually have grown up largely not seeing tobacco products in their environment. Australia, New Zealand is currently launching an entire tobacco prevention strategy based on that idea of primordial prevention, right? Preventing the risk factor from ever existing. And so that's the work that we do. And that's what takes us into those realms around education and systems of justice and planning, community services, and so on, because that's where those risk factors live. Put another way, um, public health can be described as the practice arm of population health. So you'll hear people talk about population health. And so CDC sort of talks about population health as this interdisciplinary because of where all those risk factors come from and sectors outside of health and customizable approach that allows health departments to connect to practice for, for policy change. Uh, and what I would say is that public health is the practice arm of population health. So lots of people are involved in, in population health work, but within the health system, it is public health that, that has that mandate uh, specifically. Um, even this piece that I'm talking about is not new practice in public health. And so I come back to stories from the 1800s and in particular, uh, the emergence of epidemiology and actually social epidemiology as a foundational construct in public health. And so um, how many of you have heard the story of Dr. John Snow and the cholera outbreak in London? Okay, a few. So um, anybody wanna give us the Coles Notes version on the story? What did Dr. Snow do? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Dr. Snow realized that people, obviously people were getting the cholera and started doing a spot map in London and then figured out that there was a, a contaminated water pump, or like that was the going theory that everyone who was getting sick seemed to be getting their water from the same water pump so you could handle all these problems. Um, and saw that the incidence of disease in that area went down. Yeah, and so the famous story is that he marched up to the pump and broke the handle off. Nobody knows if that's actually true, but it makes for a good story and saved the community um, that was affected by this cholera outbreak. And so thank you for that. That, that is a, an accurate depiction of what happened, but I wanna take you through the methodology that Dr. Snow used. So he did indeed identify that uh, there was an excess of cholera deaths happening in one part of the city of London, the Broad Street area of London that wasn't happening in other areas. This is a foundational entry point for any public health inquiry. These people are affected, these people are not affected. Why are these people affected? And so the, the question at the entry point is why? So why are the people of the Broad Street area affected was his first question. And his answer was eventually through some inquiry and some experimentation, the uh, drinking water seems to be contaminated. Part of how we reached that was looking at what people were drinking and who was drinking what. Interestingly, the beer drinkers were not getting sick because they weren't drinking the water, but the water drinkers were getting sick. 
And so his next question, that led him to uh, investigate the water. And so he did indeed find uh, this question that the water was contaminated. But his next question then was, why? Why was the water contaminated? Any guesses? Yeah, go ahead. This is really just a guess, but was it potentially contaminated by nearby sewage? Yes. As a matter of fact, it was. And his next question was, why? Any guesses? Okay, I'll give it away. The sewer system was in disrepair, right? Wasn't functioning well. And his next question was, you can see where I'm going. <laughs> why? Why was the sewer system in disrepair? Because the people of the Broad Street area didn't have the money to fix it. And his next question was, why? Because the Broad Street area was a neglected and impoverished area of London. So they were not paying the taxes that would afford them the opportunity to keep that sewer system and drinking water system in good repair. That led to the contamination. So Dr. Snow's major discovery was not that cholera can be transmitted through drinking water. His major discovery was that poverty is a root cause of inequities in health outcomes in a given geographic area. He and his colleagues became huge advocates for poverty reduction in the area of London. Uh, as a result of that, he himself came from poverty, so it's not surprising that he was oriented to that in his inquiry. That's the methodology that we continue to use in public health today to uncover where social determinants of health are at play. And so what Dr. Snow left us with was this idea uh, around, that we still use in public health around the aged host environment. Just briefly, this says that for any disease to be at play, there needs to be an agent that's at, in action like a, uh, um, the bacteria that cause cholera. There needs to be a host that's affected, but also that in the environment, and we've now expanded our understanding of that, it's not just the physical environment, it's the so social and economic and policy environments. That can give uh, rise to the conditions that allow the agent to be susceptible, uh, sorry, to be in existence and the host to be susceptible. Right? And so that's uh, a part of what we continue in, in public health today. So public health is the only branch of medical practice that's obligated to systematically look for these differences in health outcomes and expose them, that should say expose, not uh, dispose, uh, for the purposes of resol resolving them or uh, deploying what we call these primordial prevention strategies. And we do that because we recognize that at the end of the day, we can put everything we want into clinical interventions or even protective interventions like the ones that you might see in a family doctor's office. But the biggest uh, weight of uh, sort of input into negative health outcomes comes from socioeconomic factors. And so um, this comes from the American Journal of Public Health. It's written by Tom Frieden, who is a former director of the CDC, uh, just looking at sort of where we put um, the weight of our interventions. And we'll come back to this um, in a moment. So let's come back then to these social and structural determinants of health um, and what we really need to understand about them in order to do those types of, of inquiry. Um, structural determinants as a description is relatively new. We've been calling this the social determinants of health for quite some time, but the addition of structural points to the idea that some of the determinants of health that, we are, that we're talking about are so deeply baked into our institutional structures, all of them, that they are almost like the ether that those structures uh, operate in. We don't even see it when it's operating. And yet we can see from the outcomes that the determinants are at play and they're having a differential impact on different populations. So I currently do a lot of equity, diversity, inclusion work at the Faculty of Medicine. And we are doing a lot of work specifically on anti-racism. And what I say about racism is this is a construct that is 400 years old. And by the way, physicians were in many ways responsible for the false ideas that emerged around uh, the importance of skin color 400 years ago. And in the 400 years since what's happened is every single societal system of influence that has been created since has been created with this false construct in mind. All of them, our systems of justice, our systems of education, our systems of community service, our systems of uh, economy, have all been created with this construct around uh, differential capacities, basically, of different skin colors in mind. And so when that is the setup for all of those structures, and those structures by their nature are meant to actually support life and health outcomes, 
why would we expect to have equal or equitable health outcomes under those circumstances? And guess what? We don't, right? So when we look at statistics, we can see in public health that we see differentials in who's incarcerated, who's graduating from high school, who are the children who are in custody of the state. We see it in our chronic disease statistics, our premature death rates, our poverty rates. And by the way, there are all kinds of ways to look at poverty, energy poverty, food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation uh, poverty. All of these disproportionately affect certain groups. Chronic pain statistics, the list goes on and on and on. And so structural determinants is meant to say, there are elements of our socio-political environment that are baked into how we do everyday business in our major institutions of influence that are now resulting in these ongoing uh, inequities and, and we have an obligation to ex uh, expose those. So let's come back to what those determinants look like. So here's the list. And when I look at the list, I always like to sort of point out a couple of things. One is some of what we do in medicine is we talk about risk factors for disease and we talk about modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors, right? So modifiable risk factors are things you can do something about, non-modifiable ones are the things that you're stuck with, right? And so of this list, what would you describe as non-modifiable risk factors? <coughs> I'll give you a hint, it's highlighted. <laughs> Biology and genetic endowment. And you know, these days with gene therapy, that's only kind of sort of maybe, right? In terms of whether or not that's modifiable. All of the other risk factors on this list, all of the other determinants on this list can be considered to be modifiable in many ways. And so if they're modifiable, it means that we can modify them in the direction that supports good health, health outcomes instead of the inequities um, that we've consistently seen, right? The other thing I like to point out in this uh, list is that um, of all of the things on the list, so the 12 items on this list, some people have a list of 15, some people have a list of 13, um, but you'll notice that access to health services is only one. We're gonna talk more about that in a moment. And finally, I would point out that education and literacy, I mean, all of the ones on the left-hand side of the screen, but in particular, education and literacy, physical environments are key determinants of health, um, as I mentioned before. And so um, let's talk a little bit about how that actually shakes out in policy. So this is data from on the left from Kaihai in 2021, and on the right from the Senate of Canada in 2009 and their report on population uh, health in Canada. And the Senate uh, diagram is a little bit busy, so I'm going to walk you through it because uh, I think it's important that, you, that you're able to recognize this. Can folks see my cursor? Okay. So um, I said that uh, health access to health services was only one on the list. And so the Senate of Canada actually had their research assistants do some research on what is the relative weighting of those 12 determinants of health in terms of how much they actually contribute to any individual Canadian's health outcomes. And the answer they got for that one that is health services, which is over here, on the far right is no more than 25%. So no more than 25% of what we spend on healthcare will contribute to your, you won't get more than a 25% contribution to any individual's health outcome, right? And the bigger con uh, contributors are uh, in this middle category where they have 50%, that's early child development, education, employment, culture, gender, housing, the list goes on and on, right? And then at the very end, they have maybe a 15% contribution from, uh, what does that say? <clears throat> Physical environment is 10%, and then your uh, biology and genetics is 15, 15%, okay? 25% healthcare, that's it. And their estimate was actually between 13 and 25%. That's the contribution to your health you'll get from healthcare. How much do we spend on healthcare in the province of Nova Scotia? Oh, it's on the slide. 40% of the entire provincial budget, 40%. So 40% goes in, maximum 25% comes out. Do you see what I mean about, about the math there, right? Meanwhile, all of these other determinants by comparison get very little sort of policy weight when we're talking about health outcomes or well-being outcomes in the province of Nova Scotia. And for that 40% that we're spending on the provincial budget, in health, uh, that's where the slide on the left comes in. 25% of that is going to building of hospitals and maintaining of hospitals. 14% of that is going to our drugs and 13% of that is going to physician salaries. So the majority 
of uh, the spending is in those top three categories, right? That is a pretty heavy weight for something that has relatively little impact compared to the other determinants of health. And so this is where you start to see the complexity of the systems that we have created and the interaction with determinants of health that's actually needed in order to sustain health and well-being outcomes. So I said, why is a public health question? And I always say, why is a public health question? And so we actually have an exercise that we use to uncover those determinants of health uh, in public health. And so you'll see this in schools of health promotion. This is on the Public Health Agency of Canada webpage. We call it uh, the Jason's broken leg exercise or the Jason's in, uh, injured leg exercise or the five whys exercise. And so the first time I did this exercise, I was a second year resident, I think, in family medicine at McMaster University. And um, our preceptor uh, did a five whys exercise and it was, you know, um, 38 year old female patient comes in, she's seven months pregnant and she has recently immigrated from uh, Nigeria and her uh, HIV status is positive and go. And so we start asking the question, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why? And about 30 minutes later, we've come to this point in the tutorial where the answer is the impact of the industrial revolution on African nations, and in particular, the impact on rural populations where men had to leave the population in the rural community to go into the cities to find work. And that left the women vulnerable and exposed to sexual diseases, sexually transmitted diseases that might come back. It was something like that. And as a group of family medicine residents, we're sitting in this room going, and what do we do about that? that are we really talking about the industrial revolution? But what year is it now? Like, what can we do now? And so then what you do is you work it forward, right? Um, so this exercise uh, goes like this. Uh, why is Jason in the hospital? Well, because he has a bad infection in his leg. But why does he have an infection? Well, because he has a cut on his leg and it got infected. But why does he have a cut on his leg? Well, because he was playing in the junkyard next to his apartment building and there was some sharp jagged steel that there that he fell on. But why was he playing in the junkyard? Well, because his neighborhood is kind of run down and a lot of kids play there, there's no one there to supervise them. But why does he live in that neighborhood? Because his parents can't afford a nicer place to live. But why can't his parents afford a nicer place to live? Because his dad is unemployed and his mom is sick. But why is his dad employed? Because he doesn't have much education and he can't find a job. But why, but why, but why? And so the thing is, when you see an exercise like this, and we use these in real life in public health to get to the bottom of policy opportunities. When you, when you do this exercise, you may run to a point where you go, okay, there's nothing I can do about that because it occurred 50 years ago. But if I come forward, could I do something from an advocacy perspective around the fact that there's a junkyard where the kids play in the neighborhood? Probably, at a minimum. If I'm emer an eMERGE doc, I might stop at treat the infection and send them home. But many community advocates would say, okay, so let's do something about the junkyard. And while we're at it, let's do something about poverty rates in that community. And maybe about petitioning for a change in planning so that we can improve the infrastructure in this community, right? Those are the starts, uh, the, the starts of the conversations that you can get into when you do this method. And so when we do it in public health, we always start with the health outcome at the top. So the idea is that you look for what is the health outcome that's happening over here that doesn't happen over here? You can do it for any outcome. You can do it for a justice outcome. You can do it for an education outcome. But in health, we start with health outcomes. So what's happening over here that's not happening over here? And we use often geography as the base for that. And then we ask the question, but why is that happening? And often what we come to is because there is a difference in the risk factors that exist in community one versus in community two, or in population one versus uh, population two. And we, when we look for why are those risk factors different? What we find is that it's because the social conditions in those communities between community one and community two are different. Those social conditions are described by the determinants of health. So let's look at some examples um, of how this works in real life. So this is a real life study, 2006, I think was the last time that the city of Halifax participated, but this was a national study on street involved kids in uh, Canada. And so our task as the Halifax site was to recruit 180 unique street uh, involved youth for the purposes of doing two things. One was to get a urine sample and a blood draw to check for HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. But the other was a 45 minute qualitative interview based on the question why. And by the way, it is not difficult to recruit 180 unique street kids in Halifax. Um, we, we completed recruitment in the order of something like two weeks, right? 
Uh, and so we participated in this uh, study and the 45 minute qualitative interview gave us a tremendous amount of information, right? So the question is why? Why do you have HIV? But why, but why, why are you living on the street? And a significant proportion of the Halifax sample were able to tell us, and this is in the national report that is on, still on the Public Health Agency of Canada website, um, a significant portion of the Halifax kids were able to tell us that uh, the beginning of the end for them was when they were first divorced from what was at that point the only remaining stable adult structure in their little lives, the school system, at the age of seven. Seven, kicked out of school. That was the beginning of my street involvement, right? I had no other adults, school was it. And so we were able to take that data to Halifax Regional School Board to say, heads up, you may not have known it. We wouldn't have known it if we weren't looking for it in this way. Um, something about school disciplinary policies may have a link to an outcome that is living on the street with HIV in Halifax. Just a heads up, right? The school board wasn't entirely happy to have that conversation with us. But um, part of what we do in public health is we have a robust relationship with schools for this reason, for being available to them for policy discussions. And so we often have embedded staff in schools. So, so we were able to have uh, some, some of the conversation around that. So, that. so that's one example. Here's another example from south of the border. This is uh, on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation website. This is their 2016 Culture of Health uh, Prize winner. So if you get the chance to, to read the story, I would encourage it. This is Kansas City, Missouri. And so a medical officer of health uh, returning to Kansas City, Dr. Rex, Rex Archer, um, what it says is he returned to his hometown to lead its health department. He started reviewing the city's vital statistics to get a handle on pressing needs because when you have 480,000 patients, the whole population, you can't do a history and physical on it, everyone like you would in a, in a medical clinic, right? And so the inequities he found shocked him. Life expectancy for white re residents was 6.5 years longer than the life expectancy of their black neighbors, 6.5 years. And so the question becomes, why? And so Dr. Archer and his colleagues did that work. And what they uncovered was inequities, particularly in employment and education systems that allowed them to open policy discussions around those things and four years later, they have already reduced the life expectancy gap by two years. So we say things in public health like, oh, public health outcomes take a lifetime. That's not true. If you do this methodology well, you can actually make an impact on those outcomes that are rooted in determinants of health, right? Um, similarly, um, I talked about food security and this is an example from here in Halifax. Um, I had a conversation with my sister, who's a family physician, as I mentioned, and we did that thing that physicians sometimes do. I'm sure that lawyers probably do the same. I have this really weird case, and I don't know what to do about it. So we had one of those one Wednesday evening. And hers was, I have this patient. She's um, got chronic disease. And as I was talking to her, you know, I'm giving her the spiel, and we all know what that is, right? So what do you have to do to maintain your health? You have to eat better. You have to exercise more. And this patient started asking her questions. Well, so when you say eat better, what do you mean, Dr. Watson? And she said, well, you know, five fruits and vegetables. You guys all know this trio, right? Five fruits and vegetables to 10 servings a day. And the patient says, can it be canned? No, I'd be worried about the preservatives in the can. And so they go on and on and on. And finally, this patient says to my sister, but Dr. Watson, I can't buy that food at the dollar store. So my sister called me. And what she said was, why is she buying her food at the dollar store? Any guesses? Oh, poverty, right? So location. So say more about that, Costas. I'm actually in a car drive to Costco to get a huge, you know, bucket of bananas. And I'm like, oh, I can't buy that. And then I go back to Costco. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. I'm thinking not drugs, because I don't believe that there's a grocery store. Like there's a drugstore with you know, packaged So at the time that this happened, uh, my sister was working at the North End Community Health Center, and this was North End Halifax, and there is no grocery store, right? And so then she says to me, 
I'm a family doctor. What am I supposed to do about that? And I say, well, you could call the planning department. You could call your local MLA and have a conversation. Did you know that because there's no grocery store, my patients are reduced to this? What the heck is going on, right? Who's responsible for planning around here? And that is why public health is involved in those urban planning conversations, right? For that very reason. So we had the conversation, as we were having the conversation, this community-based initiative called the uh, Community Carrot uh, popped up. Some of you will remember the Community Carrot. Unfortunately, they didn't last for very long, but there was a local community effort to try and put healthy fruits and vegetables in front of uh, residents of the North End of Halifax. We continued in the food security conversation and public health is still involved in the food security conversation. I'm not there anymore, but one of the initiatives that we did come up with was the mobile market. Some of you will remember the mobile market or have participated. Uh, and so this is was a partnership around food security that came from years and years and years of relationship building. So I said, for example, in the case of the school system, we are in the school specifically to build those relationships, not to check children for headlights. We don't do that anymore. But we're there to be a policy resource to the school environment around the outcome that we know is most important to them, which is grade 12 graduation, because guess what? It's also important to help. So anything we can do to support that in that school environment will do. The same is true with our relationship with cities. And so up until Mayor Savage became the mayor, uh, the relationship with the city of Halifax between public health, I would say, was a little bit fraught because the Canada Health Act actually says that health is a provincial responsibility and many municipalities across the country would say that means health people go away. We don't want to talk to you. We've got other stuff on our mind. But Mayor Savage came in and asked a different question, which was what would it mean if we had health alongside us? And so public health got into a very deep relationship with the planning department and the mayor's uh, office in HRM. Up to the point where I got a random call as a medical officer of health for the city of Halifax from the mayor's office, from, uh, from one of his key um, uh, advisors <laughs> saying, if we gave you a free bus and a driver, could you do something useful around food security? And I literally hung up the phone, ran down the hallway to our health promotion team and said, somebody needs to tell me if there's a reason to say no, otherwise I'm just saying yes. And so we did. Uh, and that's how the mobile market was born. Interestingly, I went to visit the mobile market in Ottawa as part of the research for this. And when I met with the group in Ottawa, it was really interesting. So this is in uh, the north of Ottawa, I think it's an impoverished community. And I'm speaking with one of the community organizers who runs their, their program and she gave us some really good tips. One of the things she said was, please don't let the health people come in and do their health thing which is turn it into a health fair. Let's have a diabetes foot clinic over here and let's do this over here and let's do this over there. We just want it to be a cool place where people buy their groceries because nobody ever sees us for who we are. Everybody sees us as a problem to be fixed. Just one day a week, Saturday morning, can we just be something else? So I came back and said to my health system partners, here's what we're not doing. And what happened at the early days, and I haven't been to the market in a while, and I know they had some ups and downs with, uh, with operations during COVID, but in the early days, what would happen is not only would the bus roll up, and by the way, we had a staff member whose husband was an architect, and so she worked with him to redesign the retrofit for the buses so that we could flip the seats to actual market bins so that people could come in and out. And um, somebody would show up with music, and all of a sudden there's dancing happening in the lineup as people are waiting to get their groceries on a bus, because who gets to get their groceries on a bus, right? It was just that. And it was beautiful because it was dignity engendering. And that was the point that Ottawa was making for us, right? So that's the type of partnership that you get into when you start uh, doing the work around social determinants of health. Um, here's another example. This is the collected works on the screen of uh, Dr. Margaret Deckman, who was at Cape Breton University. And Dr. Deckman, some of you will know her work. Her area of study was um, children in custody at the state. She actually started her career with community services and then went on to do a, a PhD. And um, I came across her work as I was doing some work uh, around the Wendover Special Coalition, which I'll come back to in a moment, where she talked about, you know, sort of... Um, who gets to participate in the economy and who doesn't get to participate in the economy. And she was able to point to high school graduation as being a major determinant of that. And in her work, you know, she was asking then this, this next level of questions, which is, well, who gets to graduate and who doesn't, right? Who's affected, who's not, for those who are affected, why are they affected? 
And what she found when she asked the why question was that boys, if they were struggling with school or with finances, were more likely to drop out and for girls that would struggle with relationship. And these struggles would start as early as junior high school. And so of course her next question was why and her whole area of research was around sort of delving into these dynamics in school age children. Um, one of the things she found was school climate as a predictor of engagement with school. And for those of you who are not familiar with the school climate literature, this is some of my favorite literature. This is the idea that you need to provide a loving environment where every single child in the school knows that they are seen, they are valued, and they are welcome in that school environment. And I say that to family medicine residents and they say, but can you actually measure being seen valued and welcome. And I say that to pediatric residents and they go, of course, because attachment to adults matters for kids a whole lot. It's the setup for adverse childhood events or not, right? And so um, Dr. Deckman's work on, on, uh, on school climate uncovered the ways in which we could be doing more work around school climate in uh, the province of Nova Scotia. And so when she looked at school climate, uh, what she saw was that um, the sort of uh, school climate markers that we could see in the public school system in Nova Scotia had things uh, did had to do with things like uh, how teachers perceived students and they would treat students differently based on their perception and how the students felt about how they were treated by the teachers and if they felt like they were not liked for the, by their teachers they were less likely to engage in that school environment um, and this is all of this happening as we know that education is that most impactful determinant of health right and so um, what's the antidote to feeling unwelcome or, or not valued at school? It's not difficult. We all know how to do it. Love. The antidote is love. And again, I say that to the family medicine residents and they go, come on, really, right? And yet the school climate literature in the United States is posting better health outcomes for those schools that are able to concretely inject love into the school than our health promoting schools model does, which is the public health model for doing similar but not the same in Canada, right? That injection of love is a most important thing. So I had this conversation with a colleague of mine who is um, an Order of Canada recipient, Dr. Robin Williams is a pediatrician <clears throat> and was the medical officer of health for uh, regional Niagara in Ontario. And she has been a mentor of mine for a long time. And I, I, so I called Robin when I was doing this work and said, so Robin, what do you think about that? And she said, Gaina, of course, it's a loving lap for every babe. And then we both said at the same time, you can't put a program on that. Cause here's the thing. So I say that to family medicine residents, I say that to health system administrators, I say that to education administrators. I actually had an education administrator say to me, a deputy minister say to me, we're not allowed to love the children. No, we can't, that's, that's taboo. And I was like, I don't know what you think I'm saying when I say love the children, but I'm pretty sure it is actually something you can do, right? And the kids know when they are loved in that classroom environment, they know when they've been seen. And again, the US literature on school climate is posting health and education outcomes that are higher in, highs with school, uh, in, in schools with high school climate uh, than those that are not. And so the challenge is that we often like to think about, okay, so what's the program we put in place that does that? Like we need to teach people how to love each other and then somehow program that in and put all kinds of fancy metrics around it, right? Um, and there's some things that you can't put a program on, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not important, right? And so this is what Dr. Williams um, was, was pointing to. Let's look at a fifth example, uh, poverty as a policy event. So this is the one that I know policymakers hate Hate. They will say, public health, why are you trying to boil the ocean? Poverty is not something we'll ever solve, right? And so it gets seen as a wicked problem. For those of you who are not familiar with the wicked problems literature, I encourage you to look at it. Uh, beautiful description by Riddle and, and Weber from 1972 on what constitutes a wicked problem in policy and how um, difficult it is for policymakers to even go there because as soon as they see the complexity of the problem, they just, they just want to be somewhere else, right? And so I would frequently get called to tables, often by public health practitioners that sounded like this, we have to do something about poverty. And I would say, okay, but if we're gonna do it, we have to be strategic. We need a strategic end to the conversation so that we can start mapping out those five whys and give policymakers something to look at. Otherwise they're gonna run away from us. 
And so um, it turns out that if you can generate data, you can start that five wise exercise. So this is data that was put out in a, a report card on child and family poverty um, from Leslie Frank mm -hmm. and her colleagues at Acadia University uh, a year and a half ago. And what they were able to uncover is, you know, um, you know, the answer to these questions. So who's impacted by poverty in Nova Scotia and who's not impacted? And for those who are impoverished, why are they impoverished? So what are those risk factors for poverty, right? Um, and so able to uncover that in Nova Scotia, 25% of children live in poverty. Nearly 30% of children under the age of six, 53% of children in lone parent families. Uh, and then regionally, 36.5% in the Sydney uh, area. And 78% of children uh, in and around in Sebega negative. There are holes in the data. There's no race-based data. And so, but you start to see how if you can generate some of that data, you can start to generate a story of who is impacted by poverty, who is not impacted by poverty. And then you get to ask the questions for those who are impacted, why are they impacted? That's the work that will lead you to policy solutions every single time. We had a good run at this actually with COVID. And so this is the uh, World Happiness Report where they did um, a series of studies looking at the impact of COVID on in particular um, economic uh, productivity and participation in the economy. And between the World Happiness Report and our own Department of Finance uh, reports in the province of Nova Scotia, there is a story that can be put together there too around COVID, right? And so what we saw was that Canada, which is uh, third from the top, did indeed have an economic downturn, which many of us experience, and, and we could see that in our Nova Scotia uh, labor rates as well. But when we looked at who was impacted, it was specific sectors, mostly private sectors, that were impacted. And the compelling part of that story is that we get to ask the question, and who works there? Oh, it happens to be young people and women and BIPOC. That's who was disproportionately impacted. And we don't have to rely on stories. The data is right there on the Department of Finance website. It's just that nobody's putting together the story, right? So these are the things you start to do. If you use that again, that five wise methodology um, and, and start to get into the conversation. So um, the, all of these lead to these policy questions around something that I think is fundamentally important, as important as love, um, which is this idea of welcome. And I love the idea of flaming, framing any of the social determinants of health conversations as conversations about welcome. Who is welcome to participate in the economy, in education systems, in our transportation systems, in housing, and who is not welcome. And the reason I love welcome is because again, this is something that you don't have to teach people how to do. You say to any maritimer, we need to be creating a welcome into any of these sectors and maritimers take pride in their capacity to generate a welcome, right? If you ask any of us, how would you welcome somebody in the community? Probably there's gonna be a lobster. There may be fiddle music, maybe, and a whole host of other things, right? We pride ourselves on welcome. And so it's not something that you have to teach, but when you start to look at um, where is welcome happening and where is it not happening, you get some really great opportunities to dive into so many of the wicked problems around social determinants that I've mentioned today. And so we actually started this work, this is my last example, uh, in the One Nova Scotia Coalition when I was there. So I mentioned that I was part of that economic round table, which was the uh, response to the One Nova Scotia Commission that was, read, uh, that was led by Ray Ivany when he was uh, at Acadia University. And um, we were having this conversation about inclusive economies and how do we generate inclusive economies for Nova Scotia and we were having all kinds of conversation about the ways in which we need to increase immigration in the province of Nova Scotia. I fully agree with that agenda and coming from an immigrant family myself, I can't imagine growing the economy another way. However, I did pause the table to offer this. As we are thinking about inclusive economies and making sure that we make room for newcomers in our economy, are there people in the province of Nova Scotia who are already systematically excluded? And while we're thinking about it, we generate 10,000 new Nova Scotians every year by the way of birthing them. That's our birth rate. Are all 10,000 of those new Nova Scotians welcome in the economy? Will they be welcome when they grow up? That's the question we ask. Now imagine the table. This is the premier at the time, who was Stephen McNeil. This is the two opposition leaders. This is a table of business partners, 
uh, a few NGO partners and me, the lone public health physician, and I've just asked them a question about whether babies are welcome in the economy. And there was stunned silence, followed by an interesting comment from the mayor of Kentville, who said to the entire table, I think I just made a link that I never thought I'd make in my entire career, but yesterday my staff were badgering me about breastfeeding and how that was important and we needed to make space for that in the municipal building and I told them to go away. I might have to rethink that. And we had a conversation about if all the babies in Kentville knew that they were welcomed in the town of Kentville, what would that mean for their activation, their motivation to be involved in all manner of municipal life going forward? And so I followed up with the town of Kentville um, after that on uh, their work with these tiniest uh, citizens. And along the way, met Laura Fisher, who is a graduate student now at Acadia University. Laura's a single mom and immediately got interested in this question of welcome of the 10,000 citizens that we birth every year. And she was actually able to do some work in her graduate studies that uncovered the ways in which women in Kentville and their infants are actually not welcome to participate in the economy. Those infants are disadvantaged from the very beginning. And it's things like Facebook posts by landlords saying, don't rent to that single mom over there. She's nothing but trouble. Every time I've rented to her, I've had to go in and do repairs after or whatever. These are Facebook posts that are known amongst landlords in the city of Kentville, in the town of Kentville. And so moms and their babes are being excluded from housing. That doesn't set them up very well for participation in the economy, right? Things like moms, so she interviewed these moms um, who would tell her things like, we know that when we sit down on that park bench over there, we're gonna get harassed by police because they've been very clear with us that that park bench is only for the people with certain strollers. And for us who don't look like those people, we have to go somewhere else. That's not very welcoming, right? And so welcome is a really interesting way to get into the conversation about determinants of health, because when you start to look at who is welcome and who is not in any facet of society, you start to see some of those determinants at play. Now, I appreciate that I have offered you a tremendous amount today, and um, it is complex. And I also appreciate that not everybody loves complexity. In fact, many system decision makers that I know hate complexity. They hate it. They just want the answer. Tell us how to get from A to B. The challenge with working with social determinants of health is that it's never going to be a linear path, right? Because as soon as you ask the next why question, it points in the direction that you might need to go in. And it may not be the direction you thought you were going to go in before you asked the question. But if you don't ask the question, but why, but why, but why, but why, you risk applying the wrong policy solution to what's actually at play. Um, and so just by way of closing, I would say um, a few things, you know, I've talked about welcome as, a, as an opportunity, and I think um, there are all kinds of policy questions that you get to ask if you start looking at, you know, what has to be in place in, that, in order to allow wholesome participation of a number of groups, data collection would have to be key to that. And uh, in this sort of complex work of navigating social determinants, I would point out that um, you can start almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. With your why question. I said, you know, in health, we start with health outcomes. You could start with justice outcomes. It really doesn't matter. But once you start, you have to commit to following that thread everywhere, continuing to ask the question so that you can uncover what's actually um, at play. I once went to a uh, national CIHR led meeting on uh, mental health that somehow strangely had a whole bunch of lawyers and chiefs of police and then me in this conversation. And I was talking about determinants of health and afterwards the uh, head of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police came up to me and she said, when you're talking about determinants of health, do you mean determinants of crime? And I was like, yes, they are the same, right? So start somewhere, but then commit to following it everywhere. I think that's all I wanted to say. I think we've still got time for questions before cake. Thank you for your attention. And I'll leave the slide deck with you so that you can have uh, the references. Thanks, everyone. Do people have any need to leave around 20 after, but we have at least you know, 10 minutes, uh, or even a little few minutes more for questions. And I have some that are coming through the, 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 the online people, but I would just start with folks in the room uh, and I'll let you feel. Yeah, go ahead. Um, that address 
but like how it's back to health outcomes or health outcomes in general and the level which is the show benefit yeah, it's a good question. It's been a while since I've actually looked at that data, but I think so, in particular in Western Canada. I feel like Manitoba's experiment in particular was really good at mapping to those health outcomes. And what they showed was not only is there a, those health outcomes that we see, um, but many of you will be maybe more familiar with this data than I am, that um, in particular, the interventions that target women heads of households uh, fare better than those that are more broadly applied. Um, so just interesting because it challenges some of the assumptions that decision makers have around what women heads of households might do with the money. Um, but consistently now in different populations around the world, they've shown that actually that giving the money to the moms basically um, is the most impactful and it impacts on health outcomes as well as the other social outcomes. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw another hand. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So as part of the presentation, in one of the diagrams, there is a light course approach that's demonstrated. And I was curious if the light course approach is uniquely helpful in identifying and affecting public health responses and whether there are particular policy legal responses that we might think of as distinctly advancing a light course approach. Um, my own take on it is, that the life course approach, and so I didn't speak to it. I'm just going to bring the slide up uh, so that folks can see it. Um, the, the life course approach is not, it, it is helpful in that it identifies places along the life trajectory that we can intervene. And in particular, uh, identifies transitions that might be important points where folks will more acutely feel the effects of a determinants of health than not. So for example, the transition from high school to the workforce or high school to university would be one of those transition points. So I think it's very helpful for pointing, pointing out those. Um, I'm not sure that in public health, we have applied it particularly well. And so I would maybe reserve judgment as to whether or not it's been particularly useful or generative in, in public health. I think conceptually it's quite helpful, but I don't think that we've yet landed on how we do that effectively. So you'll see public health has programming, for example, for early years, we have programming for uh, in some jurisdictions, we'll have programming for seniors, but we actually have a big gap in the middle where we don't look at any of those transitions, right, uh, program programmatically. And, you know, notwithstanding what I've already said about the limits of programming, I do think that there's some attention there that we could be paying. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I see that one and two. Yep. I'm going to ask one that was, came through online. Um, and so the person has asked a sort of generally framed question around conflicting, competing values mm. uh, and asked, what is your approach to a public health issue, so you could fill in as you like, that has the potential to undermine autonomy, the autonomy of uh, an individual or maybe their human rights? Yeah. And yeah, so I'll let you go. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I would start by saying I actually had a slide on that in here and, and then I took it out. So uh, public health actually operates under its own set of ethical principles. Um, and that makes it unique within the healthcare system. Others uh, interact under an ethical framework that starts with autonomy at the top of the list. Non-maleficence, uh, beneficence, and justice might be the other three uh, principles. Public health actually has its own ethical framework and autonomy is not at the top of the list. What is at the top of the list for public health is the greater good. And that's a specific reference to, in particular, our focus on communicable diseases and environmental health threats. So if we think that the way to protect the broader uh, population from uh, threat from, for example, communicable disease is to restrict individual freedoms, we will do that. And that is permitted under public health legislation. And ethically, it's a very difficult place to stand. So it's part of the reason that public health physicians do five years of postgraduate training in, in public health after medical school is because, you know, I always say you don't want to let somebody, you wouldn't put me in the OR until I had practiced those skills under supervision for several years. And likewise, you probably don't want to let somebody lose uh, on the public with public health legislation until they practice that under supervision for several years. And some of what we'll do is look at the pros and cons for any individual situation, obviously in something as big as a COVID-19 pandemic, looking at every single individual situation becomes difficult to do. And that's part of the challenge that we had with those uh, those impositions that were made for COVID-19. 
But in general, for example, an E. coli outbreak in a daycare where we are saying that that child cannot come back to the daycare because the risk they pose to other kids in the daycare until they are free of E. coli for two negative stool samples. We might also look at that and say, but you know, in this particular individual case, that child is actually at higher risk for staying home with stressed out mom and dad than they are being back in the daycare. And the risk for that child actually outweighs any concerns we have with the daycare. If we can work with the daycare operators to find a workaround so that that child is minimally able to interact with other kids while they're still infectious, we might be able to do something. So we have those sort of permissions in our ethical framework and in our legislation, um, but we don't treat them lightly, if I, if I can put it that way. Hope, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, um, so my question's a bit roundabout and it's entirely unfair. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the heads up, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, anyone who's been paying attention to the UN and the WHO will, will appreciate those social determinants of health that you've talked about. And I was struck by how your, your case examples are all mostly individual driven, um, fighting against the system sort of uh, examples. And so, because we still have um, our health system that focuses on treatment and technology, and we still have operational systems that focus on autonomy and privacy instead of solidarity, and we still have laws to focus on, or that are driven by market-driven liberalism. Yep. So, how do we move governments, when we're talking about structural issues out here, how do we move governments off of these foundational positions? And, into a more effective way of operating? Uh, I feel like you just asked a million dollar question. And uh, so if you have any answers, I'm, I'm happy to hear them. Um, it's a question that, that certainly myself and my colleagues at the medical school actually, so what I didn't say by way of introduction is that part of my portfolio at the medical school includes this uh, work called Catalyzing Systems Change, where we are looking at how do we reorient the health system towards something more effective than what we have now in a variety of ways and not through the tech innovations that we have a thousand vendors lining up behind to sell to the health system. And, and so embedded in that conversation, we have regularly had in particular with colleagues at the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy, a conversation about collectivism and whether or not we are prepared to go there ever. And I don't know. And my, um, so my own worry is that um, as we look at the increasing complexity of what's gonna happen in the health system, but also broader health outcomes, including health outcomes related to climate. That's gonna require collective efforts and governments aren't talking about that. So instead what's happening is people are reverting to individual pathways more and more. Just as an example, I gave a talk at the EAC last week, the Ecology Action Center here in Halifax on uh, sort of the climate crisis as a, as a public health issue. And the same day that I was giving the talk, I think two articles from The Guardian popped up in my newsfeed about individual Americans and their bunker strategies that they're creating. It was something like that, right? And it, on two fronts, one is wealthy Americans who literally are hiring consultants to come tell them and their 10 best friends, how do I hire the, you know, the National Guard and like other people, retired soldiers to protect my bunker? And what do I do when the soldiers don't want to listen to me anymore? Is there a collar that I can put on them that might help me? Like literally, these conversations are happening. And also less wealthy Americans who are going to survivalist camps to learn basic survival skills because nobody's holding a conversation about how do we get through this collectively? And in the absence of that, people are making their own way. So I'm terrified that that's what's going to happen because you know one of the articles pointed very well to the idea that these systems are so complex, these questions are so complex that there's no way we get at them without a fully systemic response. And I don't see our system leaders currently do that. They seem distracted by other things. So I guess my call to all of you would be, please help galvanize system leaders from all sectors around collectivism because I guess I, sh I share your worry, but I don't have any answers. Thank you for the unfair question. We might have room for one more question, fair or unfair. Um, <laughs> but, um, okay. um, I, I, I really appreciate your talk in so many different dimensions, um, especially your sinking back to the dog that is wealthy. So I often think about my twin gender school, which yeah. I think is also in that. 
let's back him. Well, my question is about um, race based data. And Yay! If you could give us some insight on what the current discussion is yeah. about reflective challenges, the opportunities, the interaction, the, you know, all of the big questions. Yeah, and I, I'm aware that I have colleagues from Department of Health and Wellness who may have more recent information than I do, so, so feel free to, uh, to jump in, either of you. But um, so I was at the Department of Health and Wellness, the Provincial Health Department in Nova Scotia, when those conversations happened. And so a couple of, a couple of things uh, coalesced to actually have us move on race-based data collection, at least in the health system, for the first time ever. It's a conversation that is probably as old as I am. I mean, when I started as a medical student at Dalhousie many, many years ago, 1995, that conversation was alive then. So it's taken 25 years for us to come to the point where we can actually move on it. And what seems to have happened is, um, you know, a few things are percolating in the background. The Canadian Institutes for Health Information has been with their Population Health Council, which I sat on for, for some time, percolating um, a data standard for the health system to use that included race-based modifiers. And the reason that that's important is that if we're not collecting the data on health inequities in a way that we can disaggregate who has the inequities and who doesn't, then we can pretend they're not there. And that is currently the policy stance at the federal and provincial governments, maybe not um, intentionally, but in the absence of data, that's what we're left with, which is very different than what's happening in the US. So yes, there are pros and cons of collecting the data, but I think there became a realization, at least at Kai High, at, which was if public health says that they are in the business of systematically exposing you know, health inequities, but we don't actually have the mechanism to do that, then we're not doing our job. And so Kai High put out a national data standard. That was about four or five years ago. And then COVID hit. And then you know, I think a number of opportunities start to open up to say, OK, can we look at collecting COVID data differently than we've done before? And all of a sudden, provinces and territories were sort of in this conversation about, okay, what can we do and how can we incorporate the Kai High standard? Nova Scotia was one of the first in the country and helped push a national conversation around uh, race-based data collection in health as a result, at least around COVID. So um, in addition to that, in Nova Scotia, for many, many years, there had been a conversation uh, with the health data uh, folks within provincial government and health authorities around how we might do this. And a proposal had already been floated to put a modifier on the health card when it's issued so that folks could identify in a number of different ways there. And then at every reissue, they'd have the opportunity to re-identify. So between the push kind of around COVID, Kai High working in the background, Nova Scotia working in the background, those things have coalesced. So then Nova Scotia has made a firm commitment around that race-based data collection for the health system using the health card. How it will translate out to other systems like the education system, I don't know. So education is already doing some of that work with their student surveys that they send out every year in the public school system to families asking for certain identifiers. I don't know what the participation rate is like in that. And I think their um, description of different modifiers is different than the health system descriptions are using. So there'll be that kind of reconciling that we'll have to do. But that's as much as I know. John and Eric, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, so it is it is slowly percolating um, along. And again, and from my perspective, I've been at a lot of the tables where folks have said, we can't because to collect the data would be racist, for example. I've heard that for many, many years. And my response is always to not collect the data and then stay in a place of ignorance so that we can pretend the issues don't exist is more racist. And so that, that remains my current stance. I'm very happy to see that that work is happening. Oh, well, I, I have the regrettable job of bringing this to um, a close. What a wonderful um, presentation. Um, uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Watson Creed, for your powerful, accessible, you know, critically important uh, reflections and examples, uh, laying a foundation for so much of our work, but for the rest of the seminar series on the connections between health and social justice. Uh, in coming weeks and months, we'll drill into uh, further specific uh, determinants of health uh, and also of poverty, of criminalization, of institutionalization, uh, and the role of law as a determinant of health 
um, as well as ill health. So the role of law in reinforcing or disrupting uh, the racism, colonialism, misogyny, ableism uh, that underwrite uh, the inequitable distribution of health in our, in our communities. Um, so uh, I, I will be reflecting and I encourage all of you to reflect more on how law uh, might enable what Dr. Watson Creed called dignity and gendering community supports um, and how we might use law to open the doors uh, to love. Um, I hope that you'll join us for the next seminar in our series. It's October 14th, and that will be Professor Martha Jackman uh, from U of Ottawa, a renowned human rights and social justice scholar. She will be presenting uh, on the topic health and social justice, charter rights and charter wrongs. Uh, and uh, you can pick up our poster, I'll put it right way up, um, uh, and it's easily accessible on our website. And for now, I invite uh, once again those who are here and those who are, who knows, in some corner uh, online but close by to join us in room uh, 312, 312 on the third floor. It's the faculty lounge, and we will celebrate this, our 200th uh, lecture in the seminar series. Thank you again to Dr. Watson-Creed.